Today's message has been brought to you by Faith Family Church in Billings, Montana. For more information, visit faithfamilybillings.com. All right, let's get going. Hallelujah. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of review. If you're watching online, we welcome you. And we're talking about blood covenant. This is part two. Um, if you want to go to Luke chapter 24, I want to start out there. I'm going to review just a little bit because there's a lot of information uh, that we want to go through. And uh, I'm not going to get to all of it. <laughs> it's just too much. But it'll be a good foundation uh, for you to, uh, to uh, be able to identify what covenant is and the Old Testament and the New Testament and how they actually tie together in those covenants. Um, and it's the same story all the way through. Is there anybody from last week who didn't get the handouts that wants them? Okay, right there. All right, <laughs> a few. All right, Shane, I'm going to use you again. So there's the poem and there's the Jesus in every book of the Bible. <clears throat> That'll help you identify uh, the Lord in all of it. You know, sometimes people think, and I've actually heard this, and I'm not going to get technical on this because it's just not my... Uh, I guess it, I just don't feel like I should but we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament and sometimes people when in our current culture when people hear Old Testament or Old Covenant they automatically just shut off that was for the Jews that's not for us da 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 and they shut out but the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is the word of God and so is the New Testament mm -hmm. do you know that we serve the same God as the Jews okay yeah. there's no there's not a two gods it's not the God of the Gentiles, it's God overall, okay? And so we serve the exact same God. They just, well, some Jews just don't believe the Messiah has come yet. That's the difference. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. And, um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of history there that I am not qualified to speak on <laughs> because I have not studied it enough. I know enough to be dangerous and maybe cause a fight, but I don't know enough to uh, actually explain it, so I'm not going to go there. Um, but actually, the Old Testament, as we know it, is really just the Hebrew Bible is what it is. And uh, so that's, that's, that's really uh, kind of a breakdown. So when you're reading through the Old Testament, like right now we're reading through the Old Testament. If, if I don't know if you're doing the Bible reading with us, but I'm doing the chronological one. And it's just interesting to go through it and see uh, as I'm reading all the correlation between what we're talking about in these teachings and what's going on in the Old Testament. It's pretty amazing. You know, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to ruin it or destroy it. Do you know why the first covenant didn't work? Because of you and me. <laughs> it's not because God made a screwed up covenant. It's because we screw it up. So he actually had to come up with a covenant where he represented us. Why? Because we screw it up so bad. That's the simple reason why. In order to, um, and so it, things in the Old Testament, like we don't, obviously we don't do, uh, we don't kill animals today in blood sacrifice to the Lord because Jesus fulfilled all of that. But you know the Ten Commandments are still viable? Okay? People say, well, no, we don't have to follow those. You will follow them if you walk in the love of Christ that is within you. You're not going to, people think, well, we're under grace. We don't have to follow those laws. If you're under grace and you look like the world, you don't understand grace. And there is a whole message in the church today that's a, it's, it's a sly, it's a sneaky little bugger because it's, it cloaks itself in love according to human definition. And so you have to watch out because, and, and, and uh, the scriptures actually, the New Testament talks about it, that, that, that in the last days that the church or, or men, I shouldn't say the church, but men, ministers, preachers, will turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And lasciviousness very simply is just fleshy. It's just fleshy, sense-ruled, everything goes, we love everybody, everybody loves us, it's all okay, we're all going to heaven anyway when it's all said and done. And you get, this is how you run down paths of universalism, you run down paths of, of where everybody, it doesn't matter what you do because Jesus paid it all. But there are conditions to accepting what Jesus paid all of. Amen? And so you cannot reject 
uh, the uh, truths of God in the sense of who he is and the character of God within us and expect to be a part of what he's doing. It doesn't work like that. Now, we can't earn it, and this is where balance comes in in some of these things. And people say, well, I wish it was just more simple. Well, it would be if we weren't in the equation. <laughs> But we are in the equation, but God's okay with that. And it's not like the church is inferior in understanding. Because we have the Holy Spirit and we have the scriptures, amen? There's always an answer. I was watching uh, <laughs> this crazy guy on Oprah one time. Not that I watch a lot of Oprah, because I don't. But, <laughs> but I, I uh, yeah, right, yeah. I gave myself away. <laughs> um, his, his name was Eckhart Tolle. And he was, he was popular a few years ago. He wrote a book, I think, called The New Earth. He may still be popular. I don't know. And he was on there. And this guy had more devils than you could shake a stick at. You know, the eyes are the wind of the soul. And I was trying to look at his eyes on the TV. And they're going every which way but this way and that way. You know, I'm going, this guy is so messed up. And he loved everybody. You say, what do you mean by that? He was okay with Jesus and Buddha and all the religions, uh, every because it's love, and, it, and it's just universe. It's the same God. He just manifests in different ways in different cultures. Jesus didn't say that. And, but yet this man said, oh, yeah, I like Jesus. And this is Oprah's kind of doctrine, I guess, or whatever she's come up with <clears throat> in her own head and through deception that's come to her. But he said Jesus had many good teachings. I, I like He's a good man. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Sean, does a good man lie? And I said, no. And he said, I said, I am the only way to the Father. Well, that unraveled his whole doctrine in not even two or three verses, just one. But see, most people are emotional. They're not spiritual and they don't process in their mind. You know, we're not transformed by the removal of our mind. It's by the renewal of our mind, <laughs> okay? God gave you a mind for a reason. Any part of us that's a part of creation can get influenced by the enemy, and we have to watch out for that. But we have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God for balance, amen? And we know the Spirit of God in us. So it's not removing our mind, but most believers, in fact, I, was, I went to work uh, when I was doing some construction for a gentleman who went to a uh, uh, church in town and he was talking about how much he really liked this Eckhart Tolle book and I thought here's my opportunity so I just ran down the gamut with him I didn't care if I get fired off the job or not this guy is not going to go away from me thinking that I'm okay with what that guy teaches because it's not even scriptural and he didn't know what to do by the end of the conversation he did let me finish the job and he did pay me so it was good <clears throat> but my point is is that he, he is going to a church, a Christian church, but yet he's being deceived by a guy on a TV show who sounds good and emotional. We got to watch it because truth, you cannot have love without truth. Now you can have truth without love, but you cannot have love without truth. You have to have truth. We are to speak the truth in love. You have to have truth in order to have love because you have to have a standard. Amen? So anyway, what we're looking at as far as these, uh, this covenant is concerned, Luke chapter 24, verse number 44. This is the road to Emmaus that we talked about last week. And it says this, Jesus said, um, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And we talked about this, that the law is the first five books of the, obviously the first five books of the Bible. Psalms, everybody knows what Psalms is, right? And then the prophets, you know what the prophets are. All of them speak of who? Jesus, out of his own mouth, said they speak of me. They talk about Jesus, right? He's saying they, they talk of me, they speak of me. And then he says this, verse 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Let's pray. Let's pray that right now. Father, we just thank you uh, for your word and your truth. We thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit. Lord, we declare as, and ask, as you did for these men, that you open our understanding that we may know the scriptures. Show us, as Paul prayed it, Lord, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. 
We ask for this concerning this teaching and concerning the covenants, Lord. And we ask for boldness and utterance as we speak for your glory and speaking the truth in love. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so let's do this. We talked about what a covenant is. I'm just going to review a little bit. And then we got into the Hebrew covenant ritual. And we talked about the importance or what the covenant ritual was. First, they would take off the coat or the, the robe. They would exchange each other's uh, uh, coats or robes. Then they would take off the belt and, and uh, hand it to the other person. And then they would cut covenant. And they would take animals and split them down the middle and they would walk through them and they would, they would stand back to back. They would walk through these pieces of the animal in a figure eight declaring the terms of the covenant and then they would come back together face to face. Make sense? Okay, we talked about that. Shane and I did it. He kind of did a figure eight. I really did one. And then we talked about raising the right arm and we talked about the mark, um, the scar on the arm in the covenant and what that is and what the scar represents and the mingling of blood. The one person's blood mingles with the other person's and the two families symbolically become one family and they are now in covenant. And then we talked about the exchange of names. We'll get into that a little bit more today. And then we talked about how they made a scar, something permanent. Remember we read about that gentleman that went all over Africa and he cut covenant with 50 different tribes. And so if a tribe jumped out of the bushes at him and they were violent, he'd just lift his arm up like that and show it to him, and they all would figure out they had something else to do right then. Because that covenant meant, those scars meant, if you attack me, you're attacking 50 other tribes. So the, the symbolism here and the idea here is powerful because Jesus still carries his, his scars. He still carries his scars. Whenever the Father looks at Jesus, he goes, covenant, covenant, I'm in covenant with them. Make sense? Okay, it gets stronger as we go. It's really good. So we talked about making a scar. So then the seventh thing they do is the covenant terms. They give the covenant terms. And that's what I want to start with, the covenant terms. So what happens is when they're standing, and I just referenced this, but this will be a little bit more detail. When the two people are standing in the halves, okay, the, uh, they're standing before, also standing before witnesses, and they give the terms of the covenant. Okay, so Jesus, there's a scripture we quoted a lot in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So you'd have witnesses and then you would declare the terms of the covenant. I say all my assets are yours. All my money, all my property, all my possessions are yours. If you need any of them, you don't have to ask. Just come and get it. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. If I die, all my children are yours. So you want to be careful which family you cut covenant with. Okay. <laughs> all right. He says, if I die, all my children are yours by adoption and you are responsible for my family. That was covenant. Okay. But at the same time, you also get my liabilities. If I ever get in trouble financially, I don't come ask you for money. I come to you and say, where's our checkbook? <laughs> uh, people are like, yeah. How many have been married for a while? <laughs> you get it all, brother. <laughs> okay? So you get to work together. You learn to work together. So we are in covenant. Everything I have is yours and yours is mine, both assets and liabilities. So we stand there and read off before witnesses our list of assets and liabilities. So we give an accounting of what's there. Genesis 31, 52 says, this is a heap, this heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. So they had a witness, and then they set up a pillar. We'll get into the pillar here in just a minute. Genesis 21, 23 says this, Now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring, or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And I could go into a deeper on this, but if you want to read a detailed of this, read Joshua chapter 9. So if you want to mark that down, you can. I, I don't have time to go into all of it, but it's the covenant with the Gibeonites. It's in Joshua chapter 9, and there's a whole, you'll see the covenant things that take place all the way through there. 
and you should mark them in your Bible. You should underline them or highlight them or take notes in your journal, however you'd like to do it, um, to help you remember. After they declare the covenant terms, then they eat a memorial meal. Then we have a memorial meal to complete the covenant union. In place of the animal blood, we have bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? Okay. In place of the animal blood, we have bread and wine. In the Bible, wine is called the blood of grapes, Genesis 49, 11. And it represents um, our lifeblood. The bread represents the flesh or our one lifeblood. It represents our one lifeblood. So what does that mean? The two families together. So now, what, what is symbolic here? What's going on? I'm taking you into me. Okay? It's a covenant meal. So we shared words, correct? We shared clothes. We shared the belt, which represented everything as far as military, it's weapons, sword, all that stuff. We share... Uh, in front of witnesses, we share those words. We declare the terms of the covenant. Then we sit down and share a meal. See, I can sit down at a table, and at the table there can be, uh, um, let's see, what do I like? Prime rib and mashed potatoes, or as my son calls them, smashed potatoes. Um, green beans, I like green beans. Corn, uh, you know, all these things. And Shane is sitting across from me at the same table and I take from the potatoes and put them on my plate and he takes from the potatoes and put them on his plate and then I take from the prime rib and put it on my plate and he takes from the prime rib and puts it on his plate and we do this and we pour grape juice or wine, whatever you want to say, in glasses and we are both talking and, to, and speaking to one another. So what's going into Shane when I'm talking to him? My words. What's going into me when Shane, if he ever talks, to me in the conversation? His words. Job actually says this. It says in Job that the ear tastes or tests words like the tongue tastes food. Isn't that interesting? So words are going into him and into me. We're in covenant together. We're now speaking things. We're now becoming one through words. But then also in the process of this, we're eating from the same table. So there's potatoes in me and there's potatoes in. Make sense? So that's what, and bread and wine, obviously we know communion. What are you saying? I'm in covenant with God. This is why I don't understand why all those Jews got so offended at Jesus when he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I don't understand. What, they must have been so far off of their covenant teachings or willfully ignorant, one or the other, I don't know. But they, what was he saying to them? We're going to be in covenant. I'm going to take on you, you're going to take on me. Now, who gets the better end of this deal? I mean, Seriously. I heard Bill Johnson say this today. He said, if we understood the depth of our sinfulness, <laughs> I mean, we are in God's eyes, and we'll get into this here, there's nothing about us that we bring to the table other than the potential to believe and have faith, which apparently is what pleases God. So thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Because it could be rough if, <laughs> if it was God looking down going, hmm, yeah, I don't know. Do we really want to make a covenant with him? But, but thank God for his mercy and grace, amen? So it's, we, we share a covenant meal. So in the Bible, wine is called the blood of grapes, and it represents our one or union lifeblood. The bread represents our flesh. We take a loaf of bread, we break it in two, and feed it to each other saying, this is symbolic of my body. I'm now putting it in you. Then we serve each other wine and say, this is symbolic of my lifeblood, which is now, now your blood. And now symbolically, I'm in, your and your, I'm in you and you're in me. We are now together with a new nature. We are now one together with a new nature. And this was a covenant that was done. This was a covenant that was a Hebrew ritual that was done. Now, you can look up covenants. Blood covenants have been going on outside of the Hebrews for... It's, you can go way back. 
But blood covenant was originally established in the Garden of Eden. Because Adam and Eve did, God did what to cover them up? He killed a lamb. Which is what? It's a prophecy about Jesus. Does that make sense? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before you or I ever messed up, God said, I'm redeeming them. Isn't that nice? I mean, my goodness. My goodness. You, we don't, we need revelation. <laughs> okay, we need revelation. And you need to fight for it. Because once you, the devil doesn't want you to understand this. You understand this, you can go get God's checkbook. Come on. You can go get, you access what God was, what Jesus, and, and we, we, we uh, I think sometimes we go too fast in some of these things. We treat like communion. We, we, we're used to doing it as a ritual, so we lose the importance of the meditation of what should be happening while we're doing it. We, we treat it as it gets into habit. That's why like on Sunday when I just wanted to praise for, I'm just, I, I promise you, I feel like Jesus. I want to go through the temple and just start flipping tables over and just driving and just kicking chairs all around. Why? Because we, if, if we're not careful as believers, we get into routine. Oh, here comes the announcements. Okay, good. And there's nothing necessarily essentially wrong with routine. But some days, man, you just, it's like, you know, let's get, you know, let's act, let's paint our faces and come to church for Jesus. You know what I mean? Let's, let's do something to just, because people do, they get into routine. Ritualism and tradition is what makes the word of God of none effect. Jesus said it's the traditions of what? Men that make the word of God of none effect. So we have to be careful with it. We don't realize, when you're breaking that bread, that's when Jesus was pounded to a pulp so you could be healed. And if you get an understanding of that, a revelation of that, and God is not keeping it from you, he's just waiting for you to fight for it, and it's available to anybody, you get a revelation of how, bit, how, much, how nasty your sin is and how much you've been forgiven of, you'll let go of the bitterness you had toward anybody. Does that make sense? And that's the understanding of covenant that they had. But in our culture, well, we can sign a contract with a, with a, a knife behind our back. Yeah, sure. And then when they turn around, kapow, and I got 12 lawyers that are going to get me out of this. Guess what? Law was established in heaven first. Jesus is an advocate. The Holy Spirit is a witness. God is a judge. Guess what? There'll be no backing out of contracts with God. Amen? Amen? So we have to be careful with it, especially in our Western culture, because we don't take time. We're too busy. We're too busy running like crazy. Like in other cultures, you go to other cultures and study some of those things. They understand blood covenant. You go to Africa, you'll understand blood covenant. If you, if you study, now Westernization is spreading, okay? So everything we do is, it, it's Mick ministry. You say, what do you mean by that? McDonald's drive through ministry. If I can't be out of here in 20 minutes. Yeah, and God's in heaven going, oh, all I get is 20 minutes? Well, come here, hurry, hurry, hurry. Because he's so insecure, he just can't help himself. No, he just lets you go. This is exactly how God is. He will deal with you about something, but if you won't take the time to, to go to him and to spend time with him, and I realize this takes time. I realize this interrupts everybody's life, okay? I realize that. <clears throat> And God's not, he understands where you're at, but he also understands what you can give up if he needs you. Amen? Okay, so we need to understand this. It takes some time sometimes. People, do, people want this, especially in Pentecostal groups. I love this. I'm gonna bless you. It's gonna really help you. You'll either get excited or not, one or the other. Chances are good it won't be excited. But in the long run, you may get excited, and I care about enough about you to tell you the truth anyway. So <clears throat> God is exactly this way. There are people that have struggled in areas of their life for years and years and years and years. And in Pentecostal groups and word of faith groups, different things like that, we believe in the laying on of hands. And so we've, we've at times developed this culture of, and this is where we have to be in balance and everything, because I believe in the laying on of hands. 
I believe in people being set free instantly from things. I believe in people being healed instantly of things, okay? Um, we've developed this culture, though, of mick ministry. It's this, this idea of, I'm in the drive-thru, I paid for this, why isn't it hot, and why am I still waiting here? I should have been gone five minutes ago. That's not how God works. God oftentimes will do this. Oh, you have a problem. Come sit down. Well, Lord, you don't know what I have to do. Actually, he knows exactly what you have to do. Actually, he knows things that you have to do that you don't even know you have to do yet. <laughs> isn't that nice the scripture says in the old testament in, i think it's in psalms he knows when i get up and when i sit down i preached this one time at youth group you know what i had him do i preached that one verse over and over i had him stand up and sit down over and over they thought we we're in catholic church over and over and over again why and every time they stood up i said god saw that now go ahead and sit down and they'd sit down and i'd say god saw that to get it in their minds God is here, and he wants relationship with you. He's not just sitting back. This is why he set up all this covenant stuff, which I better get to, or we're going to be here a long time tonight. <laughs> but my point is this, is that God understands exactly where you're at. So people think, well, I just have hands laid on me. There comes a point eventually where God expects you to get it on your own faith. Amen. Now, we don't want to hear that today, but I don't care. Brother Hagin drilled this into us, and I can prove it scripturally. Paul said, there are things I wanted to teach you. Do you know there are churches where the people refuse to grow spiritually, so the pastor has to teach the same thing for 40 years? Guess what? That's not this church. Amen. Amen. It will not happen. Why? Because I want to go on to other things. Paul said, look, I've been, you should have been mature by now. I need to, and now I got to go back and teach the same stuff that I taught when I was here. And a lot of times it was two or three years ago. And in, the, in American culture, we treat spirituality like, well, you know, I mean, if I do it, I do it. But, you know, I'm busy. I got stuff going on in my life. What if Jesus would have said that? See, this is why I'm so glad that a lot of this is individual as much as it is corporate. Because even if I'm in a generation, which I don't believe I am, but even if I am in a generation where everybody's going to die except for me and Mike, because Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't include you. I'll include you next time. <laughs> but even if I, and I don't believe I am in that generation, but even if I was in a generation, I know that individually I can go to God. And I can believe him, and I can outlast the doubt and unbelief of a bunch of whiny babies, and they're eventually all going to die anyway because they're so weak in faith. They couldn't make it a, you know what I mean? It's the giants. The giants are out there. They had grasshopper vision. <laughs> but I know I can outlive them because I can tell. I can almost tell instantly by the tone of the voice of the conversation that's coming to me. I almost know instantly. I'm going to have to talk this person all the way back up to where they need to be, and then hopefully they'll maintain it as they go. But if they don't, guess what? God will let you manifest your fear if you want. It's not his will. It's not his desire. It's not his covenant. But we have free will, so we can choose light or either way. See, I'm a fighter. I fight. And you say, you don't feel things? I feel things all the time. And so, and I've yielded to him, but I don't stay there. I do what Paul said, forgetting those things. I press this way. Amen? Have you ever had disappointments? I could make a list. I could make a list. But that past thing can't stop me from where I need to go because I'm in covenant with the Lord. And he's the healer of that thing. And if I'm really healed from it, I'll produce fruits according to righteousness. Amen? <laughs> hallelujah god's good right hallelujah okay so we would eat a memorial meal and then we would do this and i don't have time to go into the memorial meal but in genesis 26 verse 28 through 54 you can read about a memorial meal then we would plant a, a memorial we now leave the memorial um, a memorial to the covenant i mean Everybody's familiar with what a memorial is, correct? We want to always remember it. We do this by planting a tree that we have sprinkled with the blood of the animal. 
<laughs> Hello. <laughs> a tree sprinkled with the blood of the animal. <laughs> okay? It's like, get ding, the lights should be going on right now. The blood sprinkled tree along with our scar will always be a testimony to our covenant. <laughs> Did, was Jesus was crucified on a, oh yeah, that's right. Was there blood on it? Were there any scars on him? Amen. I don't know if you noticed, but on, the, on this side of the church, now it's not, we had one in here, but we got to do something different. But on the outside, there's a giant cross. What is that? It's a tree. It's a tree. It's representation of what? Covenant. <clears throat> it's a representation of God looking down going, I'm in covenant with him. When he sees the cross, he sees Jesus. And he goes, we are in covenant. We are in covenant. We are in covenant. We're redeeming as much as we can. So it says this. This completes the ceremony. From now on, we are known as friends. In Bible times, one didn't use the word friend loosely as we do today, like on Facebook. You, become, you became friends only after you had cut covenant. Imagine if you had to do that for Facebook friend. Send him a friend request. How much blood have you lost in the last week? You'd be a little more careful about who your friends were. Amen? Yeah. And all our children are included in this covenant, even the unborn ones. Praise God. Praise God. They are in covenant because they are in us. Come on, think about it. Your great, 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 great grandchildren are in you. I... I mean, glory to God. You think about that. You know, the scripture says in Hebrews that, uh, I don't remember which, which it was, but it talks about Abraham paying tithes and that Isaac did, but he wasn't alive yet, but he was in his dad's loins. Yes. I'm paying tithes for kids that don't even know me yet. Grandkids. They don't even know me. They're just going to have to look back through the lineage and go, woo. Great, 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 ancient grandpa Sean paid tithes, and we're blessed. Hallelujah. Amen? Generational. It just keeps going. So we talk about this in, the, in, in, in planning or, or putting a tree or making a mark or building a mound. Um, in Genesis 21, 27, it says, So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men... And the two of them made, co made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because the two, men, the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose to uh, Philcol, the commander of the army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. What did he do? He planted a tree. Okay? He had witness. He had all those things in there, but he planted a what? A tree. Okay, so it's a memorial, it's a marker. There's another uh, place where this is uh, mentioned in Genesis 31, 44, and I'm not going to go there. But basically, they set up a pillar of stones. How many have seen that as well? Okay, it's a marker, it's a pillar, it's a heap. It's something that says, this is what happened here. All right, and then we talked about, um, or we're going to talk about tonight, identifying the covenant. Now, anytime you see these happenings, talking about the rituals we just, we've covered, okay? These, or these words referenced in the Bible, either actually or symbolically, you know the parties are entering into a blood covenant. You won't find all the details spelled out step by step as I have given them to you. This is him quoting from the book. Because in Bible days, everyone knew all the details and it wasn't necessary to record it all. They did. This is how they lived, okay? But get familiar with the nine steps and the covenant lingo because this is the basic ritual and you will want to recognize it as you read, um, as we read through the scriptures on covenants. 
Here is how it breaks down in the new covenant with Jesus. God says, and, and here are the terms of the covenant. I'll take all your liabilities, all your sins, all your sorrows, all your sickness on myself and become sin for you. I'll forgive your iniquities and remember them no more. I'll take all your self-righteousness and give you my own righteousness, which is pure and holy and acceptable to me. You clothe me with your robe of sin, sorrow, and heartache, and I'll clothe you with my garment of salvation and my robe of righteousness, which is my pure lifeblood poured out on the cross for you. I'll impute it to you, and you count it as righteous. Wow. We'll exchange natures. This is nice. For I'll put my spirit within you and bless you with all spiritual blessings. Does that sound like Ephesians to you? You'll partake of my own nature by the intermingling of our blood. How do you do that? Communion. Amen. You can become part of me and I'll live in your heart. My house will be your house. You can feast at my table. I'll be a father to you and adopt you as my own child. You will reign with me for a thousand years and have eternal life with me. This is my free gift to you to show that I love you. Wow. I, we're getting the better end of this deal. Jeremiah 31, 31 says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. <laughs> I love this. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Don't say, I don't know the Lord, or I can't know the Lord. Or don't say, I can't know the Lord like so-and-so. Yes, you can. The promise is right there. You can know him as good as Jesus knew him. You say, you can't say that. Jesus said, it is enough for the servant to be as his master. I didn't say those words. Now, here's what you're going to fight. Because I, if I fight it, your natural mind's going to go, uh, you don't know me. You're right. It's good that I don't know. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Just believe what God said about you. This is the key to functioning in this covenant. This is the key, okay? This is the key. You have to believe. Now, belief is not some like thing you work yourself into. It's a decision of the will. I choose to believe that what you said, Lord, about me is true, and what you said I could do is true, and I function that way. And then when you make a mistake and don't do it right, you go, that's not who I am. I have a new nature. I choose to believe what you said about me, Lord. Come on. And this is how you activate the covenant in your life. This is basic faith is what it is. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19 says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Can you hear God? I am. That's, those are my people down there. It's not like, those are my people. I mean, it shouldn't be. It, those are my people. We are in covenant. We are in relationship together. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. He said, then I will sprinkle you with wa sprinkle, sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put, my new, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be be my people and I will be your God. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 7. For if at the first covenant had been, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now, was the first covenant, what is the statement here? There was faults in the first covenant, correct? Okay, read that. Do you see that? Hold that in your mind, okay? Because finding fault with verse 8 
Because finding fault with them. Who's them? Us. <laughs> okay. The covenant in the sense of what God presented and who he was and the statutes was not the fault. The fault was me. Right? That was the fault. It, God's law is perfect. Come on. God doesn't have opinions. He's right. That's it. There's no question about it. So what is God saying here? And we got to get this because people will read the Old Testament and they'll go, oh, we, no, that had faults. Yeah, you, bugger, you're the fault. I'm the fault. Creation, as far as humanity, is the fault. We've always been the fault from the Adam and Eve on. And guess who was in Adam and Eve? You and me. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scientifically, they call it the, the, the original gene, the DNA, the original is Adam and Eve. They call it that. The evolutionists call it that. It's like, duh. What? <laughs> okay? Pay attention to what you're saying. This, what, the fault that was found was with us. So God said, the problem here is those people. And so he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Did Jesus continue in the covenant? Yes. Who did Jesus represent? You and me. It cannot be broken. Now I can leave it. But as long as I'm in faith with the creator, the covenant cannot be broken because it's based on what Jesus did for me, not based on what I did. Come on. This will set you free. Your mind will go, huh, and you got to go, shut up, mind. Believe it, heart. Let's go. And as you do, the Holy Spirit will enlighten your mind and you'll become freer and freer and freer. And people will wonder if you got like if you're on something because you'll be so happy. So it says this, he'll make a new new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor. And who what's he quoting? Now the writer of Hebrews, it's debatable, but I believe it's Paul. He's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Ezekiel, everything we just read, Jeremiah, all those. He's quoting what we just looked at. Ezekiel uh, 11, Ezekiel 36, and Jeremiah 31. That's what he's quoting in the New Covenant. Well, how's he doing that? Because the Old Testament is the Word of God and so is the New. Amen. Where do you think the apostles got their revelation from? They're all Jews. All of them. The authors of the books in the New Covenant are all Jews. Where did they get their revelation from? The Old Testament. The scriptures that they refer to are all Old Testament scriptures. People in our culture today, because we have the gifts of the Spirit, people want to imagine that uh, Paul was huddled up in a quarter somewhere and soaking in the Spirit and all of a sudden just got this revelation. No, 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 no. What true prophetic utterance, true vision, true, true gifts of the Spirit are birthed out of the written. Amen. And they are always interpreted and judged against the written. Always. Always, always, always. If we don't learn that if we don't know that well i'll just put it to you like this because i know the spirit of god spoke to me on this in fact i read after a prophet of god the other day and he pretty much said the same thing so it confirmed to me but i know god's going to clean up some of this stuff and we're going to have an abundance of the gifts of the spirit we're to desire them but in the right he's going to cleanse the waters you know what i mean get a bunch of the dirt out you know Get all the sediment out. He's not going to kill Christians that are off, okay? He's trying to get them in. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay? When people say, you know, sometimes we think that way. They think, yeah, God, get them. You know, he's not thinking. He's thinking redemptively. 
You that are spiritual, restore such a one. That's how he's thinking, okay? So that's what we're going to (laughs) become, spiritual, amen? And we're going to watch ourselves very closely. You know, spiritual people watch themselves. They check themselves. Okay, so Revelation 20 talks about, uh, verse 4, talks about reigning and living with the Lord uh, forever. Revelation 22, 1 through 5 talks about living with the Lord forever and being a part and living in his house. So, what did Abraham believe? Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. What did Abraham believe? Genesis 15. We're going to go back and we're going to look at this covenant that, was, that we referenced last week. When Abraham cut covenant with God, okay, it was 500 years since the flood and again the world had turned from God to idol worship. So when, when God cut covenant with Abraham, the flood of, it's 500 years after the flood, okay? Abram's family were idol worshipers. Did you know that? Joshua chapter 24, verse 2 declares that. Um, do you have that one, uh, Jordan? Can you put Joshua chapter uh, 20, what did I say, 4, verse 2 up for me? Um, and it declares uh, this, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in the old times and they served other what? Gods. Go down to verse 14 for me, please, there. Same chapter, just verse 14. <clears throat> now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in, the, and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. So they served other gods. So Abraham was raised in an idol-worshiping house. Okay? They lived in the city of Ur, located in Babylon between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. It was a cultural, sophisticated, but pagan country. The people worshipped the moon and made idols carved with their own hands to the moon goddess. That's what they worship. From this environment, God called Abram to his covenant of love. See, God doesn't care where you're at. He just come down in and go, hey, <laughs> you're worshipping the moon. I made that. You should worship me because I made that. <laughs> I know this is the Sean International version, but this is how I would do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would just you walk down and get, I made that moon. You know, I hold the universe like this. You sh- I'm bigger. I'm better. You should worship me. And I actually love you. I'll respond. That's just a rock up there. You, you're not getting any responses, okay? You've been deceived. So from this environment, God called Abram to his covenant of love. God told Abram to get out of his pagan land. Do you know that God will call you away from your family if need be? Hmm. God spoke this word to me at times in my life. He said, you get up and get away. Oh, okay. And so I did, and I needed to. I needed a season where I was away from the influence of certain people in my life, amen? Because it can be unhealthy. Now, it, it got right over time, but it was just a season. So God told Abram to get up out of his pagan land, Abram was to, lead his, to leave his idols and his pagan household and go to a country God would show him. There God would bless him and make him a great nation. God would give Abram a land of rest from his enemies. Praise God for that. And out of Abram's seed, singular, all nations of the world would be blessed. Genesis 12, 1 through 9 talks about that. I'm not going to go there. Four times the Bible says that God believed, that Abraham believed God. Four times the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4, 3, Galatians 3, 6, and James 2, 23. And I'm not going to go to those, but those are references where it says Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him. What we are going to learn next is exactly that what was it abraham believed that's what we're going to learn next what was it abraham believed if we can find out what abraham believed then we too can be counted as righteous if we choose to be to believe it 
We too can become acceptable to God. We too can be reconciled with our creator. We can have peace with God. Now, probably everybody here obviously is or should be. If you're not, we can fix that. But I, I believe everybody is. But somebody may be watching on the internet who's not. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind when I'm saying some of these things. We can have peace with God. So God brings Abram to the land of Canaan, and God approaches him in a way that Abram can understand. He established a blood covenant with Abram. Okay, so we just walked down all the list of what a Hebrew covenant looks like and what takes place. Now let's watch how God approaches Abram. It's the same covenant he established with Adam and Eve when he killed the animals in the garden clothed Adam and Eve to cover their sin and promised a future redeemer. That's in Genesis 3. It's the same covenant God reconfirmed with Noah, evidenced by Noah offering a sacrifice to the Lord that was a sweet, savory smell. See Genesis 8, 20 through 21. That's the first thing Noah did as soon as he got off the boat. What did he do? Covenant. Why? Because the world had become filled with word that we recognize in conjunction with Satan, violence, which is a, a, a disruption in the divinely established order of things. So when everything had been killed and, and Noah gets off the boat, what does he do? Sacrifice, covenant, boom. In other words, presence of God, come now. Make sense? Come now, minister now. Let's fill the earth again with the glory of God. Come on, this is what Jesus is going to do. Now, we're doing it. We're, we're salt right now, okay? We're doing it, but eventually there's going to be a, um, a grand finale on all of this. How many have been to the Laurel Fireworks? Okay, at the end, what do they do? They blow your eardrums off, okay? <laughs> so Jesus will come back, and everybody's eardrums will be aware. Okay, and he will, and covenant on this planet will be established through rulership of theocracy, not democracy. The day of opinions and man's opinions and the devil's influence will be sucked out of the air, and it will be glorious like, I mean, we can't imagine, okay? So, but Noah did this. Noah established what? Covenant again. He said, look, God, I found grace in your sight. This is the covenant that we have. Let's reestablish what's going on here, okay? And, of course, we know man does that for a little while, and then, you know, people get enticed by sin, and they go the wrong direction. So Genesis chapter 15, verse number 1 says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great Reward. So we talked about the exchanging of coats, right? What was God saying in this? With this statement, God is taking the initiative by offering his robe and his belt to Abram. Remember, the Hebrew ritual. God is speaking a language that Adam, Abram understands. God does not have a physical robe that he exchanges with Abram. That'd be cool, but he doesn't. But since the robe represents the person, God simply offers himself. I am your what? Shield and exceeding great reward. In other words, this is who I am. Here I am, Abram. Okay? Can you imagine having this conversation with God? I mean, that would be something. And we know Abram wasn't that great. You know, he told partial truths or partial lies. He told people that Sarah was his sister, which was a half-truth. <laughs> if you study the history, it makes more sense. Because they had some of the same bloodline. He was a liar, the boy was. But yet he had covenant with God. This is pretty interesting. Now, he didn't just stay there. He changed over time. So he was developing in the covenant. So praise God, we develop in the covenant. God does not have a physical robe so he ex to exchange with Abram. But since the robe represents the person, God simply offers himself. In effect, God says, Abram, here is myself. I offer you me. I am your reward. All that I am, I give you. I am holy, I give you my holiness. I am righteous, I give you my righteousness. I give you my life, 
Abram, pledging to lay it down on your behalf if you will accept the covenant and enter into it with me. The Lord tells Abram, I am your shield. I will protect you and fight your battles for you. I will be your strength. If anyone attacks you, they are attacking me. Your battles are my battles. Put me on as your full armor. When you go into battle, I will fight for you and with you. That's what God's saying. Then he says this, this is a covenant that was made based on God's love, not based on Abram's works. That's true. Amen? But Abram said, verse 2, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is, uh, is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And verse six, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for what? Righteousness. Okay, Abram believed and it was accounted. Everything that Abram received from the Lord came by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Verse 7, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? In the next verses, we will see that God answers Abram in a way that he will understand blood covenant. Verse 9, he said to him, bring me three, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. Abram knows that a blood covenant is the closest, the most enduring the most solemn and the most sacred of all compacts. It absolutely cannot be broken. Therefore, Abram knows that God must do the things he has promised. So what is God speaking to Abram about? He's speaking in a language that Abram <laughs> understands. Covenant, blood, covenant. Okay? So God asks for animals. What is Abram's mind automatically kicking into? Oh, I know what we're going to do. I'm sure he was astonished too. We're going to do this? <laughs> okay? So there is no need for Abram to worry and fret about it. He can rest on God's promises because through the blood covenant, he has a binding connection to God. <laughs> you have a binding connection to God. There is only one problem. How can the creation enter into covenant with the creator? <laughs> Just think about you, you, you your little self. What can you offer God? What can you offer God that he did not already give you? The, really, the only thing, and it is faith, the only thing that we have that's in our control in the sense of what we could offer is free will, which is a direct connection to faith. I mean, you're not going to separate faith from your will. It's not going to happen. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray believe that you desire and free will it's it's all tied in there okay so he says this how can the creation enter into covenant with the creator how can weak sinful man enter into covenant with the almighty all-powerful god what does abram have to offer god is he going to rescue god and help him in some way god you got a war going on you can have my sword I know, it's, this is comical. It gets better. What does Abraham have to offer God? Is he, is he going to rescue him? Why, if every human that ever lived offered all their possessions to God, it still wouldn't be worthy of covenant? The creator is beyond reach of the creation in the creation's own capacity to reach out. Isn't that true? Oh, my goodness. There's just no common ground on which man can approach God. Look at the next verse with me. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram, Abram drove them away. So this is Abram's contribution to the covenant. And in verse 12, 
we're going to see what God thought of Abram's contribution to the covenant. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. In other words, God's like, just forget it. Go to bed. Okay, you just, you go over there and lay down. Okay, I got this. All right? You know what vultures represent or fowls? They represent the enemy. Okay? So the enemy is trying to disrupt what? Covenant. What does he do today? Same thing. Okay? Same thing. So we see here in verse 12 that God actually ends up putting Abram to sleep when it comes to time to ratify the ceremony of the covenant between him and God. God is saying, Abram, if I'm going to establish covenant with man, I'm going to have to do it all if it's going to be done at all. <laughs> if you are involved in this in any way, it's going to be messed up. And they proved that in, <laughs> when the law came about. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, they proved it. They messed it up. If you try to work, if you try to be righteous, if you try to help in any way, this covenant will be polluted with you. And then it won't be acceptable to me. I'm going to swear by myself to this covenant and make sure you don't try to help me out anymore. I'm going to put you to sleep through the whole ceremony and when it's over, I'll wake you up. Sounds like grace, doesn't it? Verse 13. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will, and will serve them. And they will afflict them for 400 years. How I many you know that's Egypt? And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward, and they will come out with what? Man, the Israelites looted the Egyptians when they left. I mean, they absolutely gutted the place. And the people, the Egyptians were like, yeah, please take it. Go, please go, take it. Here, here's an earring. Here's an extra pair of clothes. You need a nicer dress? Here's a nice one. Why? All their firstborn just got slaughtered. They're like, get out. Just get away from us. We don't want anything to do with you. After all, the, all that time and all those miracles. So then he says this. I'll finish up with this here. And then we'll pick it up in two weeks because I'll be gone next Wednesday. He says this. He says, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. You should declare that over yourself. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed through, these, through the pieces. Now, if we understand a Hebrew covenant, they were doing a figure eight through there, which stands for eternity, forever, okay? But what do we know? We know that Abram is asleep during this, so he's not the one passing through the parts. So who's passing through the parts? God. So God cut covenant with himself, correct? Okay? So God will not break his own covenant. He can't break his own covenant with him, because he's not a liar, we can choose to enter it or not. We can choose to live in it or not. So then he says this. We see here that Abram did not pass through the animal parts. While he was resting, a smoking oven and a burning torch passed between those pieces. Someone, God, was walking where he should have been walking. Someone was saying, I'm dying to myself. I'm giving up the rights to my own life. I'm beginning a new walk with my covenant partner unto death. Remember, the covenant partner here is God. So someone is saying, not my will, God, but yours be done as my covenant partner. Does that remind you of anything? The Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will be done, but... Mm. Good news. <laughs> he says... It was such a brilliant glow that Abram saw walking in his place that he could only describe it as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, meaning a bright light. Abram sees a manifestation of the blazing glory and dazzling beauty of God himself walking in his place. The Almighty cut covenant with himself and stood in for Abram. He is the only one who could stand in for Abram. And all of Abram's unborn seed were included in the covenant because they were in Abram. This is why, according to Galatians 3.13, you are blessed 
with your father who? Abraham. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Why? Abram's covenant. Abram's covenant. Once again, we see how the Old Testament is a picture of a person in the New Testament. God pictured the time when he would come to earth in the person of Jesus of Nazareth to cut covenant with himself by himself on our behalf. The sacrifice, remember, was always symbolic of the flesh and blood of the one who made the walk. So this sacrifice pointed to the time when God himself would come to earth as the human lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He would cut the covenant for us while the blood of the animals could only cover sin. The blood of Jesus takes away to sin to be remembered no more. On the same day, verse 18, the Lord made covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants I will give this land from the river Egypt from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, all the ites, and Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And from here, we'll talk about this next time, but from here we'll talk about what took place in the exchanging of names, in the scar, in all these things that God did with Abram, including changing his name, taking on God's name, all those things. It's so powerful what God did. It's just simply amazing. I mean, we could, you could almost spend a year looking at this. Just one, sometimes I think it would be beneficial to just take one subject for the whole year and study it all the way out and then start a new one the next year. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we could keep our attention on focus for that long. But God cut blood covenant with Abram and he did it while Abram was asleep. How many of us hung on the cross for our sins? None. You're free because God has set you free. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. Once you understand the covenant and then you understand faith and operating in the covenant and understand the principles of remaining there, you become such a force. Then you realize when you go to lay hands on somebody or you go to minister to somebody or you go to share the message of Christ with somebody or you go to uh, uh, administer a covenant promise that God gave and established through the blood and body of Jesus Christ through you to somebody else, you're realizing, it's not me anyway. Paul understood this to the point where he said, it's no longer I who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. He understood the exchange that took place. Amen? Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. Lord, you're so good to us. We thank you for the covenant. We thank you, Lord, that this covenant is established by grace through faith, that it is established by you, Lord. You established the covenant, and it's unbreakable. We thank you for it. We believe what you said about us. We accept it. Lord, continue to open our eyes as we move forward in our relationship with you. And, Lord, as we do, we'll be doers of your word and not hearers only. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. If you would like more information about Faith Family Church, including service times and location, visit faithfamilybillings.com.